Hey everyone, Zach here, and welcome to the fifth lesson of this series, an introduction to Unreal Engine. In this video, we will set up our second map and add moving platforms to our game. In addition, we will set up a transition from our first level to our second level. You can find a copy of the game up to this point on GitHub. The link is in the description below. And make sure to check out the other suggested resources. That said, fire up your editor and let's get started. Welcome back to the editor. And when you load in your editor, you're going to notice you start in this third person map again. Now, I don't want to have this in my project file anymore, so I want to get rid of it. But before I do so, I need to say what map I want to load first. And for now, what we're going to do is we're going to go to Settings, and we're going to go to Project Settings. Now, you'll notice we have our project information in here. and I want to go to our, game, our Maps and Mode, and I want to do Editor Startup Map as our Level 01 map, and our Game Default Map as our Level 01 map as well. You'll notice there's no save button in here, and that's because it saves everything instantly. So I'm just going to close that out, and then I'm going to make sure that everything in here that I need is gone, and it is. So I'm going to go to my platformer, and I'm going to open up my level 01 map, and I'm just going to delete my third person blueprint map here. We've gotten everything we need from it. You can leave it in if you want to use that map as an experiment map. I'm just going to hit delete. And I'm going to confirm it to delete it. All right, now that that's done, I'm going to create a new level. And it's going to be level 02. Remember, the level names need to match perfectly to what you have in the enum. Or you need to change the name of the level inside of your enum. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this new map. I'm going to save my changes again. And again, we have that dark setting. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to drag in a, going to search for a sky. So I have my BP sky sphere. I'm going to drag it in. I'm going to get rid of my search. Go to light and drag in a directional light. And notice I didn't change where these are. It doesn't really matter what the location is. In my sky sphere, however, I am going to select my directional light. Now in, now, in this map, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my environments. I'm going to grab a platform, and I'm just going to set this to 0, 0, 0, like before. And then I'm going to extend the width of it on the y-axis to 2.5. And again, I'm going to set this to 11.75 in length. There we go. I'm going to drag in a player start. I'm going to put it on this side this time. I'm just going to put it towards the very beginning of the map. I'm going to hit play to make sure that works. Well, we aren't in the right mode. Now, the reason why we're not getting the right mode, again, we can change that in world settings. But we can also go to our project settings, go into there, and then we can go into maps and mode again. And in here, in our default game mode, we can set this to our third person game mode. So our level will default out to this. Inside of our world settings, we can change it so we override the project settings for that particular map. So if I hit play now, I'm in my third person mode. So what I want to do is I want to create a platform that's too far away for my character to jump to. So I'm just going to select this platform. I'm going to hit alt again, or hold alt. Now I'm going to drag out. I'm going to have to drag it a little bit further out. There we go. If I hit play, and I try to jump to that platform, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to keep falling. And in fact, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set my reset spot in as well. So I'm going to go to triggers. I'm going to grab my trigger. Again, I'm going to go to my details. With the trigger selected, or the end level trigger, I'm going to set the Z on the location to negative 1000. The start point to zero on the Y and on the X axis. I'm going to go to top view again, and I'm going to hit E, sorry, not E, I'm going to hit R for resizing or scaling. And I'm going to just scroll out a bit so I can see what I'm doing. And I'm just going to drag that. There we go. 
and then I'm going to drag it out a little bit farther. Alright, I'm going to hit W. I'm just going to move this that way. Just a little bit. It doesn't matter. Uh, to, it doesn't have to be perfect, but that that's good enough. And I wanted this to be a little bit longer, so I know I'm going to add in other platforms. So, the next bit I want to do is I want to add in a moving platform. And this moving platform is also going to double as my obstacle platforms as well. So, you know, things that might move, they'll get in my way. So, I'm going to go to my environments folder and I'm going to create a new blueprint. So, right click, blueprint class, and it's going to be of class actor. It'll be BP underscore, and I'm going to name this obstacle. I'm going to open it up. And I'm going to pin the obstacle into there. I want to get rid of the default scene route, but I'm going to do so differently than I did in the last lesson. And the reason why I'm going to do that is I need to have the static mesh as the default route because things are going to come off the static mesh this time. So I'm going to click Add Component and type in Static Mesh. And I'm going to select that last item on the list, and I'm going to name this one Obstacle. That way when I'm in the world editor, I know what I'm clicking on, I know what each part is. And I'm going to drag obstacle over default scene root. I'm going to hit compile to get rid of this default scene root on the components list. And just like we did with our platform, I want to make this a 1M cube. But I want to give this a different color so that it stands out. Actually no, I don't want to give it a different different color. I'm thinking of the next part. Sorry about that. But I do want to add two more things to this. So with obstacle highlighted, I want to type in box. and I'm going to select box collision. And I'm going to name this one starting point. And it creates a collision box that's hidden right now within here. So if I just drag that out, you can see it. However, I'm going to undo that. With obstacle still selected, I'm going to hit add component. and I'm going to type in box again. And I'm going to select box collision. And this time I'm going to name it ending point. So I now have two other components to this actor. And I'm going to hit compile. I'm going to do control S save. And now I'm going to go to my event graph. Now again, I don't need the begin actor overlap, so I'm going to get rid of that. But I do need the event begin play and I need the event tick. So what we're going to do, let me just drag, let's go back to our map for a second so you can see visually what I want to have happen. Let's go to perspective. Let's drag in our new obstacle. We're just going to put this, oops. we're just going to move this so it's in front of this platform. You might want to try different views, so I'm going to go to top, and just move it to the way it's a little bit more centered with that platform. Got to zoom in a little bit there. I'm just going to drag it there. There we go. Um, now, what I want to do when I'm in this view, actually, I'm going to go back to perspective view, is I want to select this ending point on my details panel on the right. With this selected, when I move the object now, I'm only going to move the ending point. So I drag it, you can see the ending point's now coming out of there. So I want to drag the ending point all the way towards the other platform. Now I don't want to put it directly against it because remember this is inside this was inside that sphere. If you go back to our top view for a second, you can see the starting point is right in the middle of it, and that's our cube. So we want to leave about two of those units on the other side. So I'm going to zoom in. I'm just going to leave about two units there. I'm going to double check that that is the right amount. Yep, that looks about right. So I want to have happen, if I go back to perspective mode just to show you, is I want this cube to move from its starting point all the way over to its ending point. Now I notice a small little issue, which is that the cube is a little bit higher than the ground. So I want to click the cube and I want to lower it a tiny bit. There we go. The ending point also lowered. So if I just go here for a minute, you can see they both move together. So now with it lowered, I can walk easily onto it. So I want it to go to this ending point, and then I want it to come back here. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a set of instructions in this blueprint that says go from here to there and back. All right, so in our event graph for our BP obstacle, I need to get some information. And to get that information, I need to create some variables. So there are two ways to create variables. We looked at one last time by clicking variable, and we're going to look at another one as well. We're going to use a combination of them. Sometimes it's easier to use one when we know what we need, and sometimes it's easier to use another. So I'm going to start with this clicking variable. I know I need to get the initial location at which the cube starts. So I'm going to name in a variable, sorry, I'm going to name this variable initial start location. And this variable is going to be of a vector. And this is a unreal vector, which is simply three float values together. And I'm going to drag vector onto the screen and I'm going to click set initial start location. Notice even though there are no spaces here, Unreal has separated this by where the capital letters are. And again, you can see the three float values down there. I'm going to plug the execute pin in from this set into the event begin play. I'm going to give myself a bit of room to work with. Now I need to tell it what this value is. I'm setting the value here. So this variable needs to be given a value. Right now, the value is going to be 0, 0, 0 which is not where it is on the map. Now I could go in and type those values in. So I can go into the map, find what the value is currently, and type those in. But that's only going to work for this map. So instead of doing that, I want to get my starting point. I'm going to drag it into here. When I place my starting point in the world, it has a location. So I'm going to drag off of this, and I'm going to ask for it to tell me what that location is. So I'm going to type in get world location. And it's going to give me a new node that will find out where that is in the world. And it's going to return a vector. I can just plug this value into there now. So now my initial start location will be my starting point. Now when you drag in this obstacle again, and it has a different starting point, it's going to create a new blueprint for it that has the same information. So all these functions will be on every single obstacle but the starting point will be unique for every one of the obstacles we put in the world. So with that there, now I have my start location. Now I need to get its current location in game. But this is on event begin play, so it's not going to be its actual current location. I'm just what's known as initializing or declaring and initializing the variable. So I'm going to create a variable and this will be location. It's a vector type variable, so I don't need to change its type. I'm going to drag it onto this set pin here, so we'll create a new set. And I need to initialize a value into here, or declare a value into it. I've initialized the variable by setting it here, but I need to set a value to it. So I'm going to declare a value, and I'm going to declare it as being the same as my initial start location. I'll update this on the event tick. And I'm just going to drag off this initial start location, this little uh, vector dot, and plug it into locations vector dot. So these two values will be equal to each other when the game starts. I also need to know where I want the object to go. So I'm going to get the ending point, which we've already set in the game. And just like we did here, where we get world location, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to get world location. Now, as I said, there's other ways to declare variables. Instead of just hitting you know, the add variable button, I can drag off this return and hit promote to variable. And it'll create a new variable for me in the left. And I'm going to name this initial target location. So this is a location we target the cube to go to. And I'm just going to plug the set location into the set initial target location. So all this execute pen is saying is do this first, then do this, then do this. The value for this first initial start location is our starting point. The value then for our location, which will be current location, is our initial start location. And then our value for our initial target location 
is our endpoint. I'm just gonna move these around. Where they're placed on regular blueprints doesn't matter. The only time that placement really matters is in our AI. We're not gonna have any AI in this game, so we don't need to worry about that. What matters in blueprint is the order in which these execute pins are connected. So it goes along this line, it follows this white line. I could have this all the way over here, and it's gonna go, all right, I'm plugged into there. This white line is plugged in here, and that's plugged into that one. This just looks really hard to read. It's not easy. So we want to make things just easy, visually easy to read. The next thing is I want to say how fast this is going to move. So I'm going to create a new variable. And this will be movement speed. You can name variables whatever you want. The names of the variables should be something that's easy for you to know what's going on and movement speed is going to be of type float. So I'm gonna click variable type, and I'm gonna find float. Now I'm going to hit compile. And you notice when I hit compile, this default value will become something I can enter. There we go, I have my default value, and I'm gonna set this default value to 20. It's actually gonna be really slow. We're gonna up the value later on. But again, I wanna make it so I can change this value in the world so that one obstacle might move faster than another obstacle, or one moving platform will move faster than another. So I'm gonna expose it by hitting expose on spawn, and I'm gonna make it so I can edit it on the fly by hitting this one here. Now this is gonna be a little bit weird. So I'm going to set the variable. As you notice, the value here is zero, but yet it has a default value. And this is because when we're setting it, it doesn't have anything put into it yet. So what we're going to do is we're also going to drag this onto the editor, or onto the event graph, and we're going to do uh, get movement speed, which will return that default value. And we're just going to plug movement speed into movement speed. All right, that takes care of our, our event begin play. So what it happens again, we start the game up. It goes, I need to get an initial start location which will be the location of our starting point. I also need to get a value called location, which will also be equal to our initial start location. I then need to get our initial target location, which will be the value, the location of our ending point. And finally, I need to get our movement speed. This is just declaring and initializing our variables. Nothing is gonna happen if we hit play. We've just set values here. Now we need these values to do something. So we're going to create two functions. And I'm going to show you two ways to create them. And we're going to do those off our event tick. So the first one we're going to create will be our set journey distance. Because we need to know how far something's traveled. By knowing how far something has traveled, we can know have we reached the end of our journey. When we've reached the end of our journey, then we need to change directions. And we also need to set our location and where we're moving. So it's a little bit complex. So again, the process is, what's our distance? What direction are we moving? What's our location set to that location? So I'm going to go through this, and then I'm going to walk through what's happening again. It will make sense as we go along. I will say the first time I did this, it was really confusing. And sometimes this logic, you have to think about these things backwards. So the final thing we are going to do is set the location of the cube. And we're going to do so off event tick. Event tick, remember, fires every time the computer ticks. So, you know, you tick, say, 140 some odd times a second. Every, you know, every second is going to update this 144 times, for example. I'm picking a refresh rate for my monitor. So this will update rapidly. As you get more into working with blueprints, you're going to want to use event ticks less. But for now, it's perfectly fine. So what we want to do is we want to update the location the cube is at every tick. So we're going to grab our location and highlight the exact pin here and just drop it in. It'll automatically give us a set. We're going to drag it out a bit to give us some space. And we're going to right click. And where we right click, we're going to type in the word self. 
and then select get a reference to self. What this is, is this is a reference to the particular obstacle on the map. And we want to know where it's at. So we're going to do get actor. Oops, sorry. Get actor location. And we're going to plug this get actor location into our set location. So every second, multiple times, we're going to update our location based on where the root component, the self, is. The self, again, relates to the root component, not to the other two components. We could have dragged in the cube as well. We then want to get the length of the journey. So how far has this traveled? So we are going to have to calculate that. And the way we're going to calculate that is we're going to take our initial target location. We're going to get initial target location. We are going to subtract from that our start location. So drag off your initial target location and type in the minus sign. You'll have float, vector minus float, vector minus int, and vector minus vector. Well, our initial start location was a vector, so we want to use vector minus vector. We then want to grab our initial start location and get that as well and plug that into that bottom part of the equation. So it's going to take away the start location from this, uh, this target location. Now, this returns a value that we can't really use. So we need to convert this value over to a float to see what the actual distance is. So we're going to grab this and we're going to pull off that return pin there. So these pins at the end are return pins. And we are going to get vector length. And then we're going to get this first one here. So this converts the difference between these two into a float value. With this new value, we're going to drag off of it and we're going to promote to variable. And as I said, this is going to be our journey length. So how far have we traveled? We're going to grab that and plug that into there. Right, I'm just going to move these a little bit closer, just so it's a little bit neater. You don't need to. I just like having them that way. We also need to know how far the cube has traveled. So to do that, we're going to repeat the same process, but we're going to use different variables. So I'm going to show you a fast way to do this. We're going to drag and highlight initial target, initial start, the minus, and the return vector. Scroll over and then hit Control w Wherever your mouse is, it's going to put that same set of nodes there. Now. We don't need the initial target location this time, so we're going to get rid of that, highlight that node, and hit delete. What we need is where it's currently at if we want to know how far it's traveled. So we're going to get the location instead and plug that into this little equation. We are going to, off this return vector length, get a new variable by promote to variable called journey. How about I spelled that right? Journey traveled. So how far have we traveled? Again, these names really don't matter. They should be something that makes sense to you. So if you're using different names than me, that's fine. Just make sure you're aware of what your names are and what they're for. All right, so this is actually our first function, but it's just hanging out there. So what we want to do is we want to highlight all the nodes we just made off our event tick, and then you're going to hover over one of the nodes. It doesn't matter which one. You're going to want to right-click on it, and scroll down to collapse to function. And now we have a new function there. And we're going to name this function in the top right there, or sorry, top left, set journey distance. Because it's getting how far we've journeyed. I'm just going to move this closer. And now what we can do is we can open this up. We can either click here twice or double click on the node on screen. And it opens up a new graph for us. So I'm just going to move this start pin here. So this is our starting pin up so it's not as you know as this little the execute pin, uh, line isn't going through any of the other nodes. As you can see everything we've written already is now in this new function. And not this last little bit I'm going to drag off and type in the return the word return and I'm going to hit add return node. So it's going to fire through all of this. So every tick that get distance is going to update, which will give us our location, 
the length of the journey, and how far we've traveled. The next thing I want to create is a new function. And instead of doing it the way we just did it, I'm going to show you the other way. So on the left hand side here, we have our functions. And I'm going to click function, the plus sign. And I'm going to name this one set move direction or movement direction, whatever you want to name it. And this one is going to be a little bit interesting. So we have to think about this in terms of the logic. We need to know which way is it moving. Is it moving towards the end point or is it moving towards the start point? Because remember, let's go back to our, our window here. It starts at the start point, it moves to the end point, and then it moves back. But the names of these points don't change. So we need to know in our set move direction, have we reached the end point yet? If so, then we need to change our direction. So to do so, we need an if statement. And the way if statements are done in Unreal is using branches. So drag off this execute pin and type in branch. You can also hold B down and just click the map as well. All right, and now going into this branch, we have a conditional statement. It defaults to being true, but we need to set a value here. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to check, is the journey traveled equal to or greater than, so we type in greater than and then the equal sign, is it equal to or greater than the journey length? So if it's equal to or greater than the journey length, and we've e reached the end of our trip and we want to go back. So we're just going to plug that in as our conditional statement. But we're not going to worry about you know reversing directions yet. We'll do that in a second. We're going to worry about if we are going the initial direction. So if we haven't reached the end of our journey yet, then this statement, oh sorry, this statement is journey length equal to or greater than, sorry, journey traveled equal to or greater than journey length isn't true. So we are going to set the move direction. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new variable. And this will be a vector, but we're going to name this, oh, sorry, actually, delete that. If you've created a new variable, delete that real quick. We don't want this variable, variable to be a global variable. We only want this variable to be accessible by this function. So we have another variable sort down here called local variables. You're going to click add local variable, and this will be move direction. And I recommend when you do local variables, you add the word local to the end, so you know it's a local variable. And it'll be of a vector type, so I'll click select variable type, select vector. And we're going to just plug this into the false. I'm going to drag it into the map, I'm going to set it, and I'm going to plug the false execute into that set execute pin. All right, so we need to set the direction. And the way we're going to set the direction is we're going to take our initial start location. This is why we declared it at the start of the uh, event begin play. And we are going to subtract from it. Sorry, we're going to subtract this from our initial target location. Let's get our initial target location. And we're going to drag off our initial target location and do subtract. If you need to change this, you can hit control when you're on the pin and you can drag the pin out. So we're going to set our initial target location. Sorry, we're going to take from our initial target location our initial start location. Now, we can plug this directly into there, but that doesn't give us what we need quite yet. We need to get a normalized version of this. So a normalized version gets a, a copy of the vector, ensuring that it's safe based on the length of the vector. So if we don't do this, we're going to get very jerky motions. Um, it's going to look a little bit weird. It might even, the cue might even wobble on screen a bit. So normal, the normalize function gives us a lot smoother of a motion. So we're going to just type in normalize. And we have this normalize function here. I'm just going to grab that. We're not going to change the tolerance. So don't worry about what that is. Just always kind of leave that as is unless you know what you're doing with it. And we're going to plug that into that return value into the move local. Okay. So 
the next thing we need to do is we need a return node off of this. So we're going to grab off of here and we're going to type in return. Now we need to pass this value, this move direction out of here. There are two ways we can do that. We can either just drag off of here and drop it into there or on our right hand side we have our inputs and our output. This is our output. We can click add new parameter here. I think it's just easier to drag off of here onto the return node and put it into there. And you see it generates this new output for us. I'm going to rename this as move direction. There we go. Now I'll worry about reversing directions in a second. We're going to test this to begin with. So let's go into our event graph. So up here we have our functions. We have our event graph. Let's drag out our set move direction onto the graph. Plug in these two functions into each other. So every tick it's going to set our distance and it's going to set our move direction. What we need to do then is we need to set where we want the actor to be. So I'm just going to drag off of this and I'm going to type in set actor location. And that's this just set actor location one. Don't worry about the local offset, world offset, location and rotation or relative. Just set actor location. And you notice we need a new location. Well, this move direction isn't our location, it's just the way we want to move. So we need a location value. And we're going to hold control and un and select the pin here and just drag off and then release. And it breaks the connection between these two nodes. What we need between them is the location we want it to move. So we're going to drag out location and we're going to set it here. We're going to plug the execute pins into each other. We need a bit of room, so I'm just going to extend these out a bit. So what location do we want it to move to is the question. Well, we want it to move to, we want to get its current location. So where, sorry, where is it at now? So take your location, drag it out. And what we want it to do is we want to add its move direction to that. So we could just add these together. However, it's going to go relatively poorly if we do that. So we need to actually multiply our move direction by the speed we want it to move at. And the way we can do that, we could just plug the movement speed in, but people's monitors are going to refresh at different rates, people's computers are going to have different processing speeds, so we're going to create something very similar to it in C Sharp, which is called delta time. And we're going to do that by grabbing, by taking our delta seconds, and we're going to multiply, so add the asterisk into there, a float by float. Now I'm going to make this a little bit neater. Uh, you can add in what's known as reroutes to make these nodes look a bit neater. And you do that by highlighting the node and double clicking on it. These reroutes don't do anything outside of making it easier to manipulate how the lines move, making them easier to read. So I'm just going to add in a float times float and I'm going to multiply this by our movement speed. So I'm just going to drag that out and plug that into there. I'm going to take the speed and I'm going to multiply it by the direction we're going in. So I want to move in this direction at this speed. So I'm going to drag off this move direction, type in the ashes again, and I'm going to do vector times float. I'm going to plug that float into that pin there. There we go. And I'm going to take these values and I'm going to add them to our current location. So I'm going to do vector plus vector. Again, I'm going to hold control down. I'm going to highlight this pin. Instead of breaking it, I'm just going to drag it down to this lower bit here. I'm going to move this to give myself a bit more space. And I'm going to plug in my location into there. And then I'm going to plug location this return into our location. So we're taking our current location. We are getting our movement speed and our direction. And we're adding those to our location. And then we are taking that value and overwriting the location to this new value. We're then going to take this value and we're going to tell it that's where we want to go. So grab location and drag into here and plug that into there. So plug location into new location. So walking through this really quickly, 
So what's happening is we're setting our initial start location. So where is our starting point? We are setting the location of the cube as equal to that initial start location. We are setting our initial target location as our ending location. And then we're just setting our movement speed equal to our default movement speed. Every tick, so every time the game updates, it's going to set the distance, which will get our location. It will check how long the journey is. It will check how far we've traveled. It then will go to our set direction, we'll track, which will check if we have reached the end of our journey. If we haven't, it's going to keep moving forward. It's not going to reverse our directions yet. And it's going to get the direction of travel. It's going to return this direction of travel. Once it's returned the direction of travel, we're going to take that direction and multiply it by our movement speed and our delta seconds. And we're going to take that value and we're going to add it to our location at that moment. The very next moment, very rapidly, it's going to override location to this new value. It's then going to move the cube to that new location. So let's watch this in effect. We're going to hit compile and let's go and hit our preview of it. Let's hit play. And then, oh, well, it's not moving. There it is. It's moving very slowly. So you can see the cube is moving away from us at a snail's pace. Let's up that speed. So let's select our, select our cube. And you see in our default here, we have movement speed. Let's set this to 200 and hit play. There we go. The cube is moving much faster. It's going to reach the end and it's just going to stop there because it doesn't know what to do at that point. We're not telling it to do anything. We're just saying when you reach that point, update your movement location. Oh, OK. Uh, well, we haven't told it what to do when it reaches the end location. It's just checking. Have we reached the end location? So we need to tell it to do once it's reached that end location. Sorry, I didn't mean to say it stops there because we haven't told it to stop even. So now what we need to do, if you go into our BP obstacle, go into your set movement, set move direction or movement direction, whatever you named it, we need to set what happens when the length of the journey has been reached. So when our journey traveled is equal to or greater than our length. If not, it's just going to keep moving forward. So what we're going to do is we're going to select our true pin here. And we are going to create a new local variable from, oh, sorry, we're not going to select our true pin. We're going to create a new local variable. Now in C++, this is a relatively easy thing to do. It takes one line of code. But in Blueprint, it's going to take us three nodes to do this. So we're going to create a new local variable, which will be a vector. And we're going to name this swap local. In C++, the code is literally to swap. And you're going to grab that. You're going to set this. All this is is a dummy variable that's going to currently store one bit of information. Now, to make this a little bit easier to read, we're going to just drag all of this down for now. We'll clean it up in a second. And I'm going to add in a reroute down here on the false. I'm just going to drag that there as well. So off our true, we're going to plug in to that swap local. The variable we want to store in this swap, which is just temporarily going to be stored here, is our initial start location. So grab your initial start location, get it, and plug it into there. There we go. So we're storing in this swap value what our initial start location is, so what we declared on our event begin play. So we'll go back to our set move direction. We are then going to override our initial start location. So remember, this is in order. So in order, we're setting swap location as equal to initial start location. Once swap is set, we can override our initial. Sorry, that's the wrong one. We can over. We're going to drag in our initial start location. We can override our initial start location with a new value. And the value we want to override it with is we want to override it with our initial target location. So we are switching. So drag in initial target location, get, and plug that into there. So what's happening is we are switching our initial start location with the value of our initial target location. Now we have a new start location. We need a new target location. 
So we're going to set our initial target location after our initial start location is set. And what we're going to set it to is our swap location. This is a reason why we've stored something in here. So we're taking our initial start location, we're storing it in swap. We are then erasing the initial start location and replacing it with the target location. But we still have the value from our initial start location stored in swap. And we're going to take that swap variable, so our swap local, we're going to get it and we're going to plug it into initial target location. So basically what's happening is we are switching our initial start with our initial target. And we're using the swap local as a way to store one while we get rid of the other. All right, so this is where it gets a little bit weird to look at. We're just going to take all of these nodes off the false minus the reroute we put in. And we're just going to drag this forward and then upwards. What we're going to do next is we're going to put two more reroutes in. So we're going to put one reroute over here. And again, this just make it visual, visually easier to read. And then I'm going to put another reroute just about here. And I'm going to plug this one into my set there. And I'm just going to line this up. Everything's done now, actually. I'm just lining this up to be easier to read. Because I don't like when my uh, pins and lines, sorry, when my lines and my nodes cross each other. All right. So if we go back to our map, hit compile, and go back to our map and hit play, we can just watch that cube come back. And then we can ride it to the other platform. There it goes, it hits the end location, it comes back towards us. And we can walk onto it and we can ride it across that gap now. I'm just going to jump to finish it out there. And now we're on the new platform. Well, we can also use the same thing as an obstacle. So let's create a new platform. So let's select this first platform here, hit Alt and drag out. And that's a jumpable gap, but I want to put an obstacle between the two. So I'm going to drag in an obstacle. I'm going to put it down. I'm going to put it between the two of them. I'm just going to move it so it's there. And I'm going to start below here. And I'm going to grab my ending point, And I'm going to drag my ending point up here. Now, to save time, I don't want to have to wait for that platform. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight the, this new platform we have here, the second one. I'm going to right click on it, and I'm going to make sure I'm on the top face, this top upwards facing part. And I'm going to select play from here. There we go. Oh, that cube is moving way too slowly, so let's actually reset that value as well. Let's set that also, let's set that to 250. All right. Now grab that face again and play from here. There we go, it's in the way. I can now jump over it, it's no longer in the way. So now we have an obstacle and a moving platform. Let's see if it can knock me out of the way. Ooh, I'm jumping way too high. Let's wait for it to get into the path. So it's just blocked me, I'm gonna fall off and I hit the restart point. Awesome. Now let's control S save everything. There's one more thing we need to do. We need to be able to get from our first map to our second map. So go to your maps folder, open up level one, and on this last platform, we're gonna go to our triggers in our blueprint and drag in end level. And let's just scale this out a bit so that it covers the entire end of the platform. Give it a bit of depth as well. And in here, in our level names reference, we're going to select level 0, 2. Hit save and hit play. And let's get to the end of this platform. There we go. It's loaded in the second level. And we now are in our second map. That said, we are finished with this lesson. And we're going to, in the next lesson, we are going to set up a more complex map one that's a little bit more challenging. We're gonna use everything we've done so far and put it all together. That said, if you've liked this series, I'm gonna miss that. If you've liked this series, ooh, 
Wait, we have a small little bug actually. Let's quickly fix that. Go to your level map, to, sorry, level two map. And on this reset down here, this end level down on the bottom here, let's set this to level zero two. Not zero three, that will cause an error. Level zero two. And let's just step off the side here. All right, there we go. We're on the right map again. So that said, we've covered everything you do. Control S, oh, Control S save though. Um, if you have liked this series so far, hit that like button. Make sure to hit the notify and subscribe icon so you know when the next lesson for other tutorials are out. And if there's anything you want to see in particular about Unreal Editor, let me know down in the comments below or in our Discord community, a link for which is in the description below. That said, I hope to see you in the next tutorial, and I hope that you have a wonderful day.